One, as a new panel of jurors is seated, it's impossible as we watch other jurors dismissed to come to a conclusion other than this trial against Donald Trump will be, in the end, nothing but an absolute circus. Two, reaction to our debate with destiny, plus NPR's search for the truth. And three, Bill Cotter, also known as Barstool's Billy Football, joins us on his run for Congress. It is the Will Cain Show, streaming live at foxnews.com on the Fox News YouTube channel, on the Fox News Facebook page, and always on demand by subscribing at Apple or Spotify for your podcast or, if you prefer, video to accompany this show. You can subscribe on YouTube, and you can go back and watch, for example, our debate with Destiny, which we're going to break down a little bit later in the show. Destiny has a very devoted fan base. They have Reddits. They are active in the comments section. And I have some thoughts on some of their feedback from our debate that ties into NPR and their new CEO suggesting truth is subjective. Everyone has their own personal truth. When my estimation is the true path to insanity is to all live in separate realities. My job, your job, the job of the media is ultimately to understand reality, to acknowledge truth. Let's get a little truth going today with our lunch break panel. Let's get that going, though, with story number one. Lexi Rigdon is an attorney. She goes by Lexi the Lawyer on X, and she serves as a legal analyst here for us on The Will Cain Show. And Garrett Ventry is a former Senate Judiciary Comms Advisor, and he's the president and CEO of GRV Strategy. You can find him on X at Garrett Ventry, and I'm glad to have them both here on The Will Cain Show. What's up, Garrett? What's up, Lexi? How's it going, Will? Good to be with you. Living the dream. Good. Living the dream. Let's 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 begin with the nightmare. Um, I think, Lexi, I'd love to start with you. That as I watch a new panel of jurors take their seats in New York in the case against Donald Trump, um, I think that there is increasingly, it's just absolutely obvious this is going to end in nothing but a circus. And what I mean by a circus, Lexi, is I think that this is probably ending in a mistrial, whether or not. As a hung jury, you have one lone strong juror willing to push back against what will probably be a consensus against Donald Trump. But we've already had one juror dismissed because they felt like their public information was too too made available and that their public safety, their safety was compromised. Their employment information, which is kind of generic. Most of it is like, well, this man works in IT, this woman works in law, this guy works in media. But it was apparently enough for Judge Merchant to say, yes, I can see how you have been compromised and dismiss one juror. I just think at the end of this thing, Lexi, this this thing is Donald Trump is the most public figure perhaps in the world, but definitely in America. No one can be impartial. And everyone's going to be a clown in this circus. Before this is all over, it's going to be obvious. This is a circus. It is. And this is like that story where where somebody pushes a rock up the hill and then it just rolls back down. I mean, I think we're going to have a lot of fits and starts here in terms of, I mean, gosh, we're, we're at the inception of this. I mean, we're, we're at a jury picking phase. This has nothing to do with even like, the trial or the questioning or somebody, a witness talking out of turn. And like you said, there probably is a big risk. I mean, depending on what side you're on of a mistrial in this case, because mistrials happen in even ordinary cases. And this is, I mean, are the jurors all going to be able to stay in the case? Are all 12 of them plus the alternates going to be able to stay? Are they going to be able to have a fully impaneled jury by the end of this? If these are the types of things that keep happening and I don't necessarily think that that jurors, it sounded like that juror had buyer's remorse. She said, yeah, fine, I can be impartial. And then she went home and people either got to her or she thought, you know what, I don't, I don't want to get involved in this. And now, now she's backing out. That might be the playbook that some others would employ. But this is going to be a long and ugly road for Trump, both sets of lawyers and the jurors, too, because their identities will eventually be revealed. That's what I'm saying, Lexi, and I'm sorry, I'm going to follow up really quick with you, Lexi. That's what I'm saying. 
How are they going to impanel a jury and then hang on to a jury through this trial? By the end of this, I think everyone's going to be crying uncle. They're going to be public. They're going to deal with something. They're going to deal with the kind of pressure in their neighborhood, in their communities. They're going to deal with pressure from media outlets. They're going to cry uncle. They're all going to want to get off this thing. And I just wouldn't be surprised if before this trial is over, you're looking up and your alternates are gone and two or three other jurors are gone and you don't have enough. You don't have 12 and you got to declare a mistrial. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think that that is a potential consequence of this. And also this, this, it's not like this is the only case that that's ever happened in where somebody says, you know, I don't think I can be impartial. I'm going to assume that in the Koberger jury, whenever they're impaneled in 2025, maybe somebody's going to say, you know what, regardless of, you know, regardless of the presentation, I'm not going to be able to be impartial. And that is not necessarily as scandalous as it is when it comes to President Trump, because the media absolutely blows up everything that he does. They are covering it in sordid detail, the way that he's sitting, the way he's sighing, the way he's looking at things. So, yes, it's the circus has just begun, really. Gary, one of the things that kind of stuck out to me as they're questioning jurors today is uh, how many jurors, and I'm not sure which way this points, I think it probably points to the defense of Donald Trump, how many jurors have read The Art of the Deal? Like, I mean, I guess I'm one of the few that haven't, but everybody's read The Art of the Deal. Don't tell them that next time you interview them. Um, I would read it before then. Uh, but no, no, I mean, that's right. I, th- I think it is. And I think if you take a step back, the entire process will out the gate. You're right. I mean, it's a clown car here. You're looking at the original case was brought by and, you know, discovered by Michael Avenatti, who's in jail, right? He's tweeting from jail, apparently. Uh, you have Stormy Daniels, who's a porn actress who owes Donald Trump hundreds of thousands of dollars in other jurisdictions. And then your star witness is Michael Cohen, who's a disbarred felon uh, who committed tax fraud. Like, that's what you're dealing with here. And then if you look at Alvin Bragg, he ran an entire political case, right, uh, trying to indict Donald Trump on a zombie case uh, that no one else wanted to bring. And now you have a jury here. You have a jury that can't even, like, it's taking longer than probably usual here because you have people admitting their bias towards Donald Trump. And let's not forget the judge in this case donated to Joe Biden. So this is what you're dealing with here if you're Donald Trump. You're not going to be able to get a fair process here if you're Donald Trump. And so uh, I think people are seeing that on display right now. Well, and I think it's just like it's to it's what you should expect. Like you signed up for the circus. Like This is a political right. trial. This isn't a right. legal trial. By no estimation, sure. Garrett, is this an, a, a legal trial. This doesn't survive appeal. It's shocking that it survived pretrial dismissal. It's, it's shocking that it's even made it this far because legally it's so weak, it's impossible to say this is pursuit of any true sense of justice. It is a political trial. And I don't know that you can successfully pull off. Like the whole goal has been, okay, what we need in the end is one thing. Victory is one thing. The ability to utter this statement, Donald Trump convicted felon. Right. But the circus is going to have bears and clowns and everything else along the way that I don't even know. Like, I'm pessimistic that any New York jury would ever deprive the prosecution and Democrats of that sentence, but I'm getting more optimistic that just the very nature of this thing is, hey, you chose to have a political trial in a legal setting. Good luck with how that falls out, Garrett. Yeah, no, that's absolutely right. I mean, this the entire thing is political. Like you said here, you're talking about, you know, up, upgrading misdemeanor charges to a felony to get Donald Trump. I mean, that's essentially what's happened here. And you've got the same prosecutor. We're seeing crime in New York for the last couple of years since he's been the DA letting dangerous criminals back on the street with cashless bail, right? Without, you know, with any cash spell. So I do agree with you. You're going to see this as a political draw. All it takes here is, a, is at least a common sense person to say this has gone too far. And hopefully I think you know, maybe we'll see that. This would be a major victory for President Trump. Either way, you're seeing him campaigning. Uh, you saw uh, Joe Biden try to replicate it at his, his sheets, and it was like, you know, some random guy off the street walked in. Uh, but you saw Donald Trump at a bodega, and you saw the, uh, obviously, the, the support he had there. So there is a plus to it there. But I do think at the end of the day here, uh, if Donald Trump does defeat these charges in New York, it's going to be a major turbocharge for his campaign, especially going into the other scam indictments from Jack Smith and Fannie Willis. Yeah, I mean, you say all it takes is one person who is willing to be fair and impartial. It's not even about politics at that point. It's psychology. Correct. Lexi, we've had this conversation a lot recently here on the show. What I mean, Garrett, by, by psychology, I'll put this to you, Lexi, is like, you're not looking for a conservative. You're not even looking for an objective person. You're not looking for a fair person. 
you're looking for an aberration in humanity. Like yeah. you are looking for a person who is willing to be disagreeable. I've talked to a lot of friends who are attorneys. It's like the fundamental human instinct is to be agreeable. We all want to fit in. We're herd animals. And so if you've got 11 people who believe one thing, good luck finding the one person who's comfortable being disagreeable. I don't even care about their politics. Like it's just it's it's you, you it's against every one of our instincts, Lexi. I completely agree. The peer pressure in that jury room, if it gets if it gets as far as the jury deliberating in this case, at at least for this trial, I mean if there's a mistrial or something then they could try him again, but the peer pressure in that room of, come on, you know, we all know he did it. He broke the law. Let's get going. I want to go home. I want to go home to my family. I want to get back on social media. That is going to be a significant thing. And they there's going to have to be somebody in there with the intestinal fortitude to stand up and say, this is not, you know, this is not appropriate. This there, there wasn't actually a law broken here. And this is a Frankenstein indictment that was put together and I don't want to participate in this now of course if that were to happen there were a hung jury then the judge would they would come out and the judge would say try a little harder to come to an agreement and that is also right that's an issue because then they go back and they're like oh okay you know fine uncle I'll, you know, fine guilty you know so that's um right. yeah it, you're absolutely right about human nature and one of the things that strikes me so much about this trial is that in New Jersey where I practice if you're out on your own recognizance and you're not subject to any conditions, these can drag on for years before you actually see a, your trial date. And the fact that they indicted him last March and now he's sitting in a trial 13 months later, that cannot be the norm in New York City. It's not the norm here. And this is obviously, as you said, this is so that they can say he's a convicted felon. And who knows if they even care what happens on appeal. They just need him to be a convicted felon until November. And then, you know, if it gets overturned on appeal, it gets overturned. At that point, you know, he's right. either won or lost. Right, it, because it's a political trial. You make such yeah. a good point that Jonathan Turley made on this show on Monday, which is like, okay, so you've got to fight the human instinct not to just fit in. You've got to be willing, strong enough to be disagreeable. A. B, you got to fight that peer pressure within that room when everyone's saying, hey, I need to get home. My son's got to travel baseball game. Quit hanging Quit making this a hung, hung jury. C, you've got to you've got to withstand the peer pressure of your community. I, mean, I don't know if they'll be sequestered, but you got to go home. And like you pointed out, that probably already happened to one juror who cried uncle and asked off. So you're going to have to go home to your community and not give in to the peer pressure. But then the biggest one comes. Then the hammer comes. That's D, as you point out. It's the judge. So you're strong enough to withstand all of that, and you, you, you hang a jury, and then the judge is mad because he wants to have a conclusion, and he goes, no, go back and work it again. You have to come to a conclusion, which is basically all pointed at one juror, if it's one or maybe two, and the other 10 or 11 look at that person and go, the judge is telling you, fit in. I mean, it's just like, it's an impossibility. I mean, it's all you have to do is establish reasonable doubt. Okay, I get that in legal terms, but in psychological terms, it's just, it's a huge, huge societal human outlier. Um, Bill Belichick is a human outlier, Garrett. He's a, <laughs> the greatest coach of all time. Um, but he revealed on the Pat McAfee show, never once in his life has he had a cup of coffee. Now, I mean, I don't know what coffee consumption is in the United States, but it's got to be Mine is what do you think coffee penetration is? Is it it's eight? High. 95? High. 95. Um, a, what does that say to you about Bill Belichick? B, what have you never done that everyone else does? Wow, that's a good one. Uh, so, A, what does it say about Bill Belichick? I'm a Bills fan, so I was terrorized by him for two decades. So I've got a you know very uh, a hard feeling towards Bill Belichick. But it's very interesting he doesn't drink coffee. I mean, I guess that is not being dependent on caffeine, I guess, the way I am in the morning. Maybe that does actually help him be uh, – I saw in the article – He's like, I drink orange juice and maybe tea. So it's not that surprising. He's got like a roboticness about him, right? So uh, I guess there, what is one thing I haven't done that other people have done? Wow. That is a good question. I'll have to come back to that one. Mm. Well, I, don't I, I, I've, uh, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know think... if I can answer that question off the top of my head. What have you, what's There's yours, Will? Garrett won't do, apparently. <laughs> yeah. Don't tell that to Alvin Bragg. Yeah. Um, but, uh, Guys like me and Garrett. I have Gamers. never, I have never voted for a Democrat. How about that? <laughs> okay. Uh, 
Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm, I, I make the joke, like, I'm good to try most things. So yeah. never is a carrying all the weight in this question. Like, but I don't. Well, it's because well, my what coffee consumption is do. going down. Yeah. It's, yeah. Right. Herd animal. Yeah. Um, my coffee consumption is going down. I'm liking it. I, I'm definitely peaked on coffee, and I'm on the downhill slope. Uh, I'm I'm enjoying it less now. I think it's directly tied to the increase in my nicotine intake. So uh, instead of having two or three cups of coffee, it's a coffee and a zen, and I'm set for the for the morning. But um, yeah, I, I I don't I'm not as in love with coffee as I once was. So you know, bully I've for never Bill watched Belichick, the I never watched the Wonderful Wizard of Oz or whatever. There you go. <laughs> oh. I'm trying to think of that. a lot of people yeah. watch that, I suppose. So there you go. Have you seen? Wait. You're young, but uh, have you seen The Godfather? Oh, absolutely. I've never seen it. Okay, there you go. Okay. Isn't that crazy? I've never seen it. And I'm from Jersey. I should see it. it, it you know, it's the whole the mob stuff, but nope. You should watch it tonight and report back. I should. Tomorrow I'll be back <laughs> on the show reporting my review. You know, The Godfather's one of those movies that supposedly you could ask any man and he's seen it, but I actually think it's getting old, and I'm not sure that's the case anymore. Like, you know, I don't think if you run into it, 27 30 year old dude that they've all uh, it's probably been replaced like i think mean, ask most dudes about 30 years old have you seen the big lebowski you got you got a decent chance that they've seen the big lebowski maybe you could keep coming a little, maybe super bad and yeah, trust sure. me folks i'm not putting super bad on the same level as the godfather <laughs> but i just think you know it's it's getting back there it's like saying have you seen gone with the wind almost you know right. i think young oh, people more and more the answer is it no. is a great classic movie, though. I mean, oh I'm, I'm 100 percent Sicilian, so you got to watch it. You every have to line watch of it. that movie. You guys are talking about two different movies for sure. They're, Absolutely, I mean, I'm talking about this Godfather. This is the gender divide. I'm Lexi, talking about Godfather. Oh, okay. I'm talking about Gone with yeah. the Wind. Lexi, you're talking about Godfather. Gone with the Wind. There you go. <laughs> All right, let's move to uh, Google. Um, 28 employees of Google have been fired for for staging a sit-in. At Google, this was targeted at the AI department, who's made a contract apparently with the Israeli Defense Forces to target um, combatants. Is the in in Gaza? Um, these 28 employees apparently invaded the uh, personal office of Google Cloud CEO Thomas Kurian. Uh, they wrote a list of demands on his whiteboard. They disrupted the workplace. Um, it was under the banner of No Tech for Apartheid. And Tuesday was their day of action. Uh, apparently, there's a $1.2 billion cloud and AI contract with Israel, between Israel and Google. You know, one of the things about this, Lexi, that th th my, my takeaway, what I think about when I see this story is that people have a real hard time understanding uh, free speech, both as a guarantor by the First Amendment in the United States Constitution, but even, even culturally. Like, I, I just think, um, I think it started with Colin Kaepernick, like, at least this conversation a little bit, maybe because I was in sports. But I think there was a lot of people who saying, you know, free speech. Well, he was wearing a San Francisco 49ers uniform and doing it in the course of business. And that is not a place where your First Amendment rights are protected. Now, if Colin Kaepernick wanted to march in the streets against, you know, police injustice of San Francisco, that's different. And so, the, like, last week, by the way, Woody Johnson, owner of, of the New York Jets, threw his weight behind Donald Trump. And a lot of people are like, oh, you can do that, but Kaepernick can't protest police violence. Yes, he can. He just can't do it on the job. Mm -hmm. And like these Google employees learned a very hard lesson. You can do that in the streets. You can't do it in your boss's office. This is a, a, a classic example of F around and find out. You know, they, they decided to get crazy. They decided to, I wrote it down actually, it was defaced property in the office, disrupted um, the business goings on intimidated other employees. And instead of just doing that and saying, yeah, we know we're getting fired, but this was more important. This is the hill we wanted to die on. Their spokesperson came out and basically said that they were indiscriminately fired. You know, how dare Google pr protect their business and their other employees and their reputation? I mean, it's like, what kind of millennial Gen Z take on this you know, it would be one thing. I mean, I, I find the whole thing distasteful, but we'd be more palatable if they went into it saying, this is so important to us that we're willing to risk our jobs and we understand what's going to be coming down the pipe. But don't do it. Don't be all tough. And then complain about it because you lost your fancy Google job. I mean, this is, it's, it's honestly madness that anybody thinks that they were going to be able to get away with this 
I don't know what reason. Yeah. I mean, you know, to make it fair, you know, Gary, I've always said, like, look, if a Walmart checkout clerk wore a Make America Great Again hat to work the counter, the bosses are perfectly fine saying, hey, not on the job. Right. Mm -hmm. No, that's right. I mean, you're making half the customers feel uncomfortable. People are going to Walmart to literally, you know, buy goods or groceries or things they need. They're not going there to make a political statement. They see enough on TV and in their daily lives, right? They don't want that. And so I do think it's interesting. There's kind of a breaking point here, which is interesting, because a couple of years ago, companies might actually have allowed this. When you think about, you know, everything we saw from the Me Too movement to Black Lives Matter to the COVID lockdowns, there was a point where people were kind of allowing this insane type behavior. And so it's good to see that there's actually a breaking point that a liberal company in Silicon Valley, like Google, I know it happened here in New York City, which also a very liberal city, uh, was able to say, you can't just cause absolute chaos in the workplace and be rewarded for it. You get fired. And so I think Lexi's right. It is kind of like an, an F around and, you know, you find out moment here. You can't act that way. And so it's good that companies are doing that. I disagree with Google on a lot of different things, but it's good that they're standing their ground. That you can't have workplace behavior like that. It's absolutely ridiculous. You know, there's one more thing on this free speech, because I mentioned the difference between your First Amendment guarantees and also sort of, which I think is quintessentially American, the cultural embrace of free speech. And there's a lot of confusion, I feel like. And it's happening, by the way, on the right as well, where it's like, um, just because you have a right to free speech doesn't mean you have a right to get paid for your free speech. Like, if you're if you're a public sphere, public space, yeah, you have First Amendment rights, okay? I think culturally now, if you're a public platform like X or Facebook, then – and what I mean by platform is you're not a publisher. You're a platform. Um, you should not be censoring views. You should embrace almost an absolutist position of free speech in the pursuit of the cultural American embrace of free speech. But it doesn't extend to a publisher. Like a publisher can have an editorial point of view and say, hey, this does or doesn't align. And I think a lot of people are going, well, I thought you – you know, your free speech. Yeah. And by the way, I, for me, if I were a publisher – my personal editorial point of view would be, I want people to disagree with me. I had a guy on earlier this week named Destiny who I disagree with on a lot of things, and I want that because I think it enhances my editorial point of view. But others don't believe that, and I don't think that makes them obligated under the banner of I believe in free speech to pay people for speech that doesn't fit, I guess, what they believe to be their editorial vision. Yeah, I agree. I mean, as a as a publisher, right, that's that's different than obviously a, you know, a platform or free speech, or especially when you're talking about a lot of times these are – you know, privately owned or privately run platforms, right? Or excuse me, publishers are, are different than a platform, obviously. So no, I do I def generally track that. But I do agree with you that there is something about disagreement being a good thing. You see this on editorial boards. You see this on panels, on shows. It's good to get both views. It's good for debate. And it's good, honestly, to reform your own opinion or, you know, for viewers to hear another opinion. Yeah. Lexi? What you're talking about reminds me of the whole Candace Owens, Ben Shapiro thing where, you know, she left the Daily Wire, um, whether of her own accord or not, we don't know the details, but he went on and said, hey, we are a publisher, we're not a platform. So even though, yes, we do believe in free speech as a concept and they're not a public entity. So it's, you know, free speech is more of a concept as opposed to a legal construct. But they said, we don't have to actually publish and put out things that we don't agree with. That's not what we're here for. We are not a platform for people to just use it to get their message out. And I agree with you on the fact that people mis misunderstand. I'm not sure that that's a word, but I'm going to use it. Misunderstand the concept of free speech. And it goes back to a conversation you and I had weeks ago about people not understanding how the influx of illegal immigrants could actually change the allocation of, of votes in the electoral map. And because people have a basic misunderstanding of civics. And that kind of goes back to this also, where you have a private employer and somebody is saying, hey, that's against free speech. All right, well, you don't get free speech at Google. <laughs> you have to abide by the workplace right. handbook. That's what you have to do. You have to be an employee and abide by your requirements as an employee. You can't just say whatever you want. That's not how that works. But a lot of people do not understand the nuance. And frankly, it's a, it's not even all that nuanced, but people just don't understand it. So Lexi's referencing a conversation we had a few weeks ago where illegal immigration, whether or not illegal immigrants get the right to vote by affecting the census, they affect 
the um, the representation in Congress, and they can affect the Electoral College as well, and then affect the way the country votes by the, merely their their presence. You can go back and find a previous episode of that conversation by subscribing at the Will Cain Show on YouTube. All right, Lexi, the lawyer on X, a legal analyst and attorney in New Jersey, and Garrett Ventry, former Senate Judiciary Comms Advisor. He's on X at Garrett Ventry. I really appreciate you guys hanging out today on the Will Cain Show. Thanks, Will. For having us. All right. All right. It was mentioned there. Earlier this week, we had a conversation, a debate with popular uh, YouTuber, kick streamer, formerly Twitch streamer, Destiny, Stephen Bonneau. Um, Got a lot of feedback, got a lot of interaction from the audience. And it made me think about, let's go through that interaction. Let's talk about that reaction to that debate, because it made me think about the new editorial mission and the point of view of NPR on the truth. That's next on The Will Cain Show. It's time to take the quiz. Five questions, five minutes a day, five days a week. History, pop culture, science, sports, civics. How much do you know? Let's find out. Who was the first person to walk on the moon? Jackson or something? Neil Armstrong. Take the quiz every weekday at thequiz.fox and then listen to the quiz podcast to find out how you did. Play, share, and of course, listen to the quiz right now at thequiz.fox. Pete Hegseth's eye-opening new book, The War on Warriors. The army I fought for has gone woke, and it's time to fix that. The veteran and Fox and Friends weekend host exposes the problems in today's military. How a far-left ideology has infiltrated the system and is putting our entire country at risk. With critical insight into the changes that need to happen in the Pentagon and America before it's too late. The War on Warriors by best-selling author Pete Hegseth. Pre-order now at foxnewsbooks.com. I'm Dana Perino, and this is Perino on Politics. Dana Perino, co-host of The Five and co-anchor of America's Newsroom, returns to Fox News Audio with a brand new podcast, Perino on Politics. Listeners of Everything Will Be Okay will be thrilled by the return of a familiar voice, but with a fresh spin as Dana guides audiences through the 2024 election cycle. Make sure you subscribe to this series wherever you download podcasts and leave a rating and review. NPR's search for the truth, perhaps it can be informed by the conversation we had right here with Destiny on The Will Cain Show. It is The Will Cain Show streaming live at foxnews.com on the Fox News YouTube channel and the Fox News Facebook page, Monday through Thursdays, live, 12 o'clock Eastern time. And then always available on demand by subscribing on YouTube, Apple, or Spotify. I got to give Stephen Bunnell, I got to give Destiny credit, not only for interacting with people whom, whom he holds deep disagreement, but also for curating and developing an audience that I have to say I find engaging, interesting, honest, wrong, and funny. We've got a lot of reaction in our YouTube comments from uh, the audience for Destiny, and he has a very active Reddit as well uh, of fans of Destiny. Now, Destiny is a... um, streamer, uh, very popular on the left, who has had many viral debates with people like Jordan Peterson and Ben Shapiro and Candace Owens. And as the vision for this show becomes increasingly clear, I am someone who is very interested in having conversations and debates. It's obviously part of my past, my career is part of my personality as evidenced by being on places like First Take or CNN. And I want that to be part of the ethos of the Will Cain Show. So I wanted to read through some of the feedback that we received on the comments right here on this YouTube stream of the Will Cain Show or on Reddit. And I wanted to share with you some of the feedback we got. So first, this here um, is posted by a man named Snow Eagle 213. He said, I got to give credit to this Will Cain guy. He asked smart questions and gave smart replies and was genuinely curious to hear Destiny's responses. I've never heard of this guy, but I'm surprised such a thoughtful person like this works at Fox News. And obviously he's a bit ignorant on some things, but I don't get bad faith vibes. He seems genuine. Let's hold it there for just one second. 
I appreciate that. I'm not coming at this in bad faith, and I am genuine. And then it gets to my favorite part of that reply. We can put that same one up. If you look below, somebody named Scoggy says, Agreed. My favorite thing was that Cain gave Destiny huge amounts of space in the conversation. I'm not sure he ever interrupted Destiny at all. And I think Destiny returned the favor as well. But I wouldn't call Cain ignorant, and I wouldn't confuse genuine for being benign. On the right-wing populism to topic, Destiny laid out a bunch of different ways Trump is threatening democracy. Cain's response was, yes. I like this change, especially focusing on the middle class. Kane doesn't refute all the dangerous stuff the Republican Party is up to. He endorses it and then reframes it to more palatable aspects of the right. It was a good conversation, and I'd like to listen to another one. Kane is genuine, but we shouldn't forget the substance of what he is genuine about. He genuinely supports Trump and his efforts to destroy U.S. democracy. He believes all of Trump's criminal charges are a meritless witch hunt by the deep state and Biden's DOJ. Kane is nice, polite, smart, and also a radical right winger with ludicrous views. <laughs> I, I love this. I love this. Despite whatever you might see, be careful of the wolf in sheep's clothing. I am, despite what you may hear, filtering through the prism of politeness, still crazy. Could be willing to entertain the idea, always in pursuit of self awareness. But those tables can be t turned. It could also be that I'm correct, and that maybe you are indulging in some lunacy. Uh, this was a mystery to me. Um, commenter on their Reddit page said, he is mewing during all pauses, giga chad. And then they all went on about this mewing thing. Somebody else said what I'm thinking. What is mewing? This is the only place I've ever heard this term. What meme is this? And then another person says, it's people pretending that pushing your tongue on your palate all the time instead of letting it rest and flexing your jaw muscles can change the morphology of your jaw and face to look manly. It's mostly incel science, unproven. <laughs> but then there was a debate like, who's mewing? Is it me or is it destiny? Somebody said he's mewing with his chest hair out. Bold move. That would be me. Another said, that's actually just his goatee. Then that would be destiny. <laughs> So let me just go back to the control room for just a minute. Uh, young establishment, James, maybe is more versed in internet culture. Uh, two a days, Dan, what is mewing? Do I mew? Uh, you know, I'm going to defer to the younger James on this one because I just learned what it was, too. What is mewing? Are you mewing now? Do you mew no. all during the show? No. You... <sighs> is that what you do? There's, there's, what there's, is mewing, James? There, there's an obsession a lot on Twitter about kind of perfecting your jawline to – Make yourself more uh, palatable uh -huh. to uh, females, but it's there's better ways to do it than like playing with your tongue. You, you, and we got we got Billy over here too. He's he's laughing at us over here. <laughs> well, hold on, you. hold on. I'm not too well. Versed I can in this, see I'm Billy football in the background. <laughs> First of all, James, clear your throat. Uh, second, uh, <clears throat> James, uh, you hint there are better ways to perfect your jawline. What would those be? How how? Because I'm going to tell you something. Surgery. I might be mewing. Uh, I might I might be mewing without even knowing what uh, mewing was. I might be kind of giving myself that alpha jawline. Yeah, our, our good friend Andrew Huberman has these little blue things that you could chew on. Oh, that yeah. works a little better. I've seen those. Um, could eat less cookies and lose weight. That's probably the best best way to do it. Bought it. Genetics. Genetics Bought sometimes. It. Own the jaws or size. <laughs> own the jaws or size. I own it. Bought it off of Instagram. <laughs> then I read it gives you locked jaw. So I had to back off. Billy Football over there in the background. Um, were you familiar? Yeah. I mean, we're going to run for Congress, and I don't know if this is. Uh, you just tell him Billy Football is about to join us. He's from Barstool. He's running for Congress. Billy, I mean, you're going to deal with a lot of important issues of the day, but were you familiar with mewing? So it's actually not even of my generation. I'm 25 years old. It's actually more of like college kids now, high school kids. It's like oh, a wow. TikTok thing. So it's it's. Something even new to me, but it, it has something to do with just like even like doing the pose with like, yeah. it's it's weird. It's it's even <laughs> weird for my generation. I assume like you know the actor Timothy Chalamet. Like I assume he mu like muse all the time. His jawline is just insane. Or Henry Cavill or something like that. It's crazy. All right. Well, we'll bring Billy Football back on more important issues here in just a moment. But here's another comment I want to throw up. Uh, Will Kane is altering his accent to cater to the idiot right. It's so effing hilarious to me. 
And someone says, he's from Texas. Calm down, chief. And then someone links to one of my debates with Stephen A. Smith on first take and says, listen to his accent there. Then watch the video of Destiny's debate with him. It has been four years. Your accent doesn't revert or adapt that, adapt that fast, boss. And then the other rebuttal is, you never heard accents pop in and out? You know what? Destiny read it. Once again, I'm going to plead guilty, although it's not a, it's not a affectation. I, in that time frame, when you saw me destroying Stephen A. Smith, I have now moved back to my home state of Texas. And I think I've learned this about myself. My accent is malleable, but this is the real me. That other New York version of me, that was two 15 years long in the making. This is back to authenticity. Speaking of first take, I had a fascinating conversation with a buddy of mine this morning about, you know, truth and how you communicate with people. And I was telling him, you know, when I was on first take and a lot of the comments from Destiny's folks were like, wow, when he was on first take, he was so divisive and he's so different in this conversation with Destiny. Well, first take is divisive. It's a debate. It's like going into a courtroom and saying the lawyer cross-examining a witness is being too pugilistic. It's like, come on. The show starts with, I believe the light was green, and someone responding, I believe the light was red. And by the way, it's not manufactured. It's two differently, truly held beliefs. But that's the format of the show. And the conversation with Destiny was more like, I want to understand how you think. I'm going to share with you where I think you're wrong. I'm going to tell you how I think. But here's what I really think. Either way, first take or a more cordial searching conversation, this is how you arrive at the truth. And whether or not I think the light was green or you think the light was red, the light was either green or red. There is objective truth. And that needs to be explained to the new CEO of NPR. Watch. But the hard things, the places where we are prone to disagreement, say politics and religion, well, as it turns out, not only does Wikipedia's model work there, it actually works really well. Because in our normal lives, these contentious conversations tend to erupt over disagreement about what the truth actually is. But the people who write these articles, they're not focused on the truth. They're focused on something else, which is the best of what we can know right now. And after seven years of working with these brilliant folks, I've come to believe that they are onto something, that perhaps for our most tricky disagreements, seeking the truth and seeking to convince others of the truth might not be the right place to start. In fact, our reverence for the truth might be a distraction that's getting in the way of finding common ground and getting things done. All right, that was courtesy of TED Talks. And I don't want to make an ad hominem attack, but I do feel like I'm ready to go sit on the center square or square in the preschool and make sure I've stacked my blocks right. It was a little bit pedantic, a little condescending there. But hey, it's a TED Talk. So here's the thing. She's not all wrong. So there are people, we all do walk around with different truths, but they're not the truth. Your perception and my perception inform what we believe to be the truth. And even though they used to joke on first take that I would say I have a monopoly on the truth, I understand that none of us have a monopoly on the truth. But objective truth has to be our North Star. It exists. And that's what we are working to understand and move toward. And why? Because if you don't understand reality, you can't change reality. You can't live successfully within reality. This stuff about my truth, your truth, it's all bullshit. That's not real, even though you can live through the world of subjectivity and perception. But the point is, we understand not only our perception, but others. And this is why I want to have conversations with guys like Destiny, because here's how it works. Destiny and I are sitting in a diner. Dude walks in with a 45 and robs the diner, right? I see something, he sees something. It's panic. It's adrenaline. And we're probably going to come away with different recollections of the events. I think mine's true. He thinks his is true. But whatever we each think is true really doesn't impact the real truth. There is a truth. Something happened. The light was red or green. He did walk in and then raise his gun. Or he had his gun raised when he walked into the diner. But the point is, the way we get to an understanding of actual truth is by recognizing the humility in our own perception, interacting with other perceptions, not giving in, not false kumbaya, not whataboutism, 
but using it to inform a closer understanding of objective truth. So that's what I want to do with a guy like Destiny. And I would submit that's what NPR should do, which would mean, by the way, entertaining beliefs of people like me or Billy Football or anybody right of, of Bernie Sanders. Because right now, that's who you are, NPR. You're locked in one perception informed by a left wing of ideology who honestly would look at Barack Obama in 2010 and say, wow, he's alt right. So maybe for you to understand actual truth, you might need to entertain some other perceptions that help inform your perception, pushing you closer to actual reality in the world. Finally, this is the final comment here from Destiny's Reddit. Uh, DT Might says, that was surprisingly one of the best discussions I've seen in a while. I certainly was not expecting Destiny to bring up parchment guarantees. It's referencing Justice Scalia. And have Cain not only be familiar and engage with it, but actually fair, fairly accurately describe the meaning and context around it. By the way, they then link to the Scalia testimony, which I would encourage. It's awesome. Scalia describing what makes America exceptional, why we are free. It's amazing. And Destiny happened to pick one thing that I was a big fan of, a moment and a man that I'm a big fan of in Scalia. Uh, real quick, uh, there was a response. I agree. I want to see more talks with this dude for having such an apparently crazy worldview. There we go again. He was surprisingly engaging in good faith and clearly intelligent. Thank you. I want to do it too with Destiny. And then finally, look at the bottom. I was going to bring this up, guys. Uh, two a days, uh, Establishment James. Did you guys notice when Destiny first came in? I said, welcome. And he says, um, I'm here to work my way up and then stops himself. And there was a debate in this whole forum like, what was the politeness that interrupted him finishing that sentence? Do you think he was about to say, I'm, I'm working my way up to someone bigger than you, Will Kane. I'm working my way up to Hannity. Was it an almost <laughs> insult of me? What, what, what happened right there? Yeah, or some, some kind of insult or joke, like your mama joke or something, too. Some people were saying it might have been. Like, or just I'm, I'm working, working up my, to your mom's house. Yeah, exactly. I saw that so many times on Reddit, so it was really funny, though. Well, here's what I'd say. Uh, bravo, Destiny fans. I think you're funny. I think you're wrong. But I also think you also show a great amount of good faith and interest in working towards the truth. May you all be future employees of NPR. All right, coming up. This is real. We take this seriously. Barstool's Billy Football is running for Congress in New York. Billy Football, famously, of Pardon My Take, number one sports podcast, now looks to represent the United States of America. Next on The Will Cain Show. Stay on top of the latest forecast with America's weather team in the palm of your hands. Here's the latest from America's Weather Center. It's Fox weather updates throughout your busy day, every day. That heat's going to be out there for one more day. Temperatures being 30 degrees above average. Put the power of over 100 meteorologists and the worldwide resources of Fox in your hands with the Fox Weather Podcast. Precise, personal, powerful. Subscribe and listen now at foxnewspodcasts.com. Is this the start of a NASCAR dynasty for Ryan Blaney? Ready to go to work. A redemption tour for Chase Elliott. Is Denny Hamlin a ruthless competitor or a villain? Is it time for a Bubba Wallace breakthrough? Or Ross Chastain to get back to breaking stuff? Or is this the making of the wildest ride you'll ever witness? Yeah, it's all of the above, and it's about to go down. Yeah! Let's go! Woo! The NASCAR Cup Series from Talladega. Coverage begins Sunday at 2 Eastern on Fox. It's time to take the quiz. Five questions, five minutes a day, five days a week. History, pop culture, science, sports, civics. How much do you know? Let's find out. Who was the first person to walk on the moon? Jackson or something? Neil Armstrong. Take the quiz every weekday at thequiz.fox and then listen to the quiz podcast to find out how you did. Play, share, and of course, listen to the quiz right now at thequiz.fox. Bill Cotter, a.k.a. Billy Football, is running for Congress. Barstool's Billy Football is running for Congress. It's the Will Cain Show, streaming live at foxnews.com. 
the Fox News YouTube channel, the Fox News Facebook page. Hit subscribe, by the way, on YouTube or Apple or Spotify. You can keep up with us every Monday through Thursday. Friday is a sports edition of The Will Kane Show. I understand the comment section is not only full of uh, Destiny fans uh, who we've managed to provoke, but now we run the risk of the most rabid fan base on the Internet. We run the risk of provoking the Stoolies who have arrived here on The Will Kane Show because of the presence now of Bill Cotter. Billy Football, what's up? How are uh, you? Thanks for having me. I don't know. Is it Mr. Cotter now? I don't even know what to do here. Billy Football, <laughs> Mr. Just Cotter. Call me Bill. What do we do, Billy? <laughs> All right. Hey, did you go by Will back in college and now you're Bill? I so throughout my life I've been William to my parents, Will to my friends, Bill to other people, Billy to a lot of people. So, you know, whatever floats. You're a Will, so you understand. When did you go from I William know, that's to why Will? I asked. It's a big move. Yeah. Never was William. In fact, the yeah. name is Williams. It's my mom's maiden name, but I just went by the, my middle name since I was a kid. But I, they, I mean, I've never ch- like the the changing your own name. Um, like you know, like I have a son, a Charlie. At some point, does Charlie grow up and be like, I got to be an adult, so now I'm Charles? Um, I don't know, but I think it's a bold move for somebody to go. Will Will stayed in college. Now I'm Bill. <laughs> well, I was actually <laughs> Billy in college, really. So. <laughs> You know, got to okay. cut the funny business. It's Bill now. <laughs> but uh, how are we doing? <laughs> Drop the Y. I'm glad to have you on, man. So let's start with this. Um, I know who you are. Um, um, fan of what you guys do. But let's start with this at the risk of provoking you in the audience. So let's establish. This is real, man, right? Yeah. This isn't for the content. No, this is dude. real. You're running for Congress. We're in deep right now. <laughs> we're, we're getting served with papers by opponents. We're in the weeds. We got the signatures. We have to go to Albany for a hearing. It's, it's getting, it's heating up. I mean, this is way too much trouble to just be doing it for content. We're going for, we're going for Washington, D.C. You know, it, we're, we're in too deep, so we're going in. <laughs> All right, and I want to get into the why and how, but let's get into the what you're talking about already, man. The the, I mean, like you said, it's getting dramatic. So first, you got the signatures. That seems mm-hmm. clear. You needed twelve fifty signatures. Right. You got more than that. Twenty four hundred. Yeah. Um, but it seems like the first fight, Bill, is that the your your challenger, your main challenger, and maybe the Nassau County um, Republican Party are challenging the signatures. Is that the first fight here? Not just you, by the way. All the other four candidates behind the quote-unquote established leader? Yeah, exactly. So basically we cleared all federal standards, all state standards, sent the signatures up to Albany. We're good. And then in the final hour probably they could have submitted it. They submitted a challenge to get every single candidate off the ballot uh, except uh, their guy who I don't even want to mention because he's getting way too much press from this. So, uh, And now I've just been gotten a follow-up suit in the courts, not just a challenge to the ballot, but in, I guess, civil court, right, from the actual candidate directly at me um, that was served. Never been served before. It's a fun experience, kind of, uh, but it's nothing like Pineapple Express. And uh, so now we're going to be dealing with two court cases. It's a two-front war now. Um, so, you know what, honestly, this has become, I had my reasons to get into this, but now I'm just getting more and more reasons Uh because it, as an outsider to politics, as a lot of people know, this, this isn't, this isn't democracy. This is something different. This is nothing that our founding fathers intended it to be. Um, and we're going to take this fight and we're going to run with it because, you know, I, I, I want to usher in a new era of transparent politics and I've been very transparent about my campaign, every level, you know, and uh, a, the new generation deserves that transparency that old politicians, and as we've seen, operate in the darkness. I operate in the light. Mm-hmm. I'm not, you know, suing people to try to get them off the ballot. I, you know, I may be using all the means I have to try to, you know, make this individual's life, uh, you know, hell for doing that. But it's, it's insane. What does that mean? Well, you know, he, he's getting a little hard time on Twitter, but... Uh, uh, basically, New York the State have been marshaled. I they were not. I did not. They just saw the situation and reacted accordingly. Um, New York State okay. <laughs> has uh, has the least amount of protested primaries in the country. So 
Uh, compared to New Jersey, which has 85% of all primaries, there are multiple candidates running democracy. People vote for them. New York State only has 35%. And this is relative to other mm -hmm. states like Illinois that have uh, 69%. California also has 69%. So New York, out of all the states in the union, has one of the lowest amount of contested primaries where uh, individuals are selected by local organizations as opposed to voted in by registered people of that party in that district, which that's a problem. All right. It is a problem. I don't want the whole stump speech in one answer now. I want to. I got a lot I want to ask you about here. And by the way, uh, you know, by the way, you're tempted to go. I'm listening, and I've listened to a lot of politicians. You're not just hitting your talking points. At first, I thought you were going to say you've been provoked in the few, the the real Dave Portnoy mentored style. Now you've made me mad. Before I wanted to fix America, but now you made me mad. But no, you you pivoted to transparency and and the founding fathers. And I was like, wow, okay, you know, better take Billy football seriously here. This is this is not talking points. This is this is stuff. Last wait, guy who I want didn't got knocked out. Because we can't brush. <laughs> That's another story. What's that? Last guy who didn't take me seriously got knocked You're about out. Ken's... Yeah. You're talking about Ken Seiko. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I watched it. Uh, and by the way, you're using 20000 of that $50,000 in earnings yeah. to fund the campaign, right? Yeah. You knocked out. For anybody that doesn't know, Billy knocked out at Rough and Rowdy, Jose Canseco, quick, real quick. Uh, and won 50K. Yeah. Crazy. Now I'm in another crazy scenario. So well, <laughs> they're connected in one way. So, yeah, I put up 20K of my own money to start this campaign. Uh, and, you know, we received tons of donations to the cause uh, in every and we use that limited amount of money to get on the ballot. We ran an extremely resourceful grassroots campaign. And unfortunately, I'm now seeing why you need to raise a lot more money because you might get on a two-front war with two court cases and having to campaign. So, All right, so I want to talk about both those two two wars real quick. Mm -hmm. So let's go with the first one, that the one that happened first. So what mm -hmm. are they saying? That your signatures are bogus? They're not real signatures? They're like, based, what's, the, what's their allegation here? To, to... There's several allegations. Uh, basically, they've disqualified 15 under their uh, – lawsuit they've disqualified 1500 of the 2400 signatures basically saying only 700 ish are valid because of various issues they're saying that some people are not registered some people put illegible signatures illegible names illegible addresses basically completely arbitrary striking off signatures from the ballot which we're going to now have to go through and be like that's uh you know that's a nine that's not a p just totally arbitrary stuff that they've been throwing. And this has been their playbook for years. And I'm probably one of the first people to bring light to how ridiculous of a process this is. And even though it's legal, it, it's not right. And it's not democracy. And uh, it's a unique situation in New York State. And you said, it's not just you, by the way. Mm -hmm. It's all the challengers to the front runner had their signatures challenged. And he his signatures have not, however... Whatever he did, he never got ballot. challenged. I assume it involved at least some signatures. Yeah, never got we, challenged. We don't know. He might not even have any signatures, but he wasn't challenged, and no one sent a lawsuit against him. So he did it the last second before the uh, deadline. And if that's how he wants to win the race, I don't see how you can set yourself up for the general election and think that no one's going to call you out on those actions. And you know, you were anointed, you were selected, not elected. So it's a it's an interesting situation that is impacting not just this race uh, and not just New York State, but it's probably happening all across the country. And I think it's a microcosm of much larger issues that we need to deal with in politics, especially in this day and age. Yeah. OK, so tell me about the second front of the war, because you said it just happened. You just got served. First of all, I want to hear what it's like. You said it's not like Pineapple Express. <laughs> and then but I saw you posted it on Twitter, too. And but you haven't said what that's about. What did you get served for? Uh, to then challenge my signatures and challenge me off the ballot in not just in Albany and not just for a federal hearing, but for a, I, I don't, I think it's technically civil court. Um, so basically doubling the lawyer fees, doubling the resources needed to try to ensure we stay on the ballot. And we're still currently on the ballot. So um, we're not budging. We're going to stick our heels in and, you know, fight this because it, it's honestly completely ridiculous and going to this might turn out to be a Supreme Court case. So 
I, I, I can't believe I'm saying that, that I'm in the middle of this, but hey, you know, we might get a, a Cotter versus <laughs> Board of uh, Elections going, so who knows? So real, real quick, I mean, I'm being serious. I'm, yeah. I am taking you serious. You, you, you know, you, that's kind of, to your point, can you get this done? Can you survive the signature challenge? Do you have the money to do mm. it, to pay the attorneys in time to remain on the ballot? So we're working with some guys who are pro bono. Um, hopefully, uh, you know, if you go to BillCotterForCongress.com, if you want to donate to the cause, because a lot of people are waking up to the exact, you know, the swamp's not just in D.C. There's many swamps around America, and they're all kind of connected in some sort of way. And I, saying that now, it's sort of like, you know, seeing it firsthand, I'm like, oh, my God. Like, when people are talking about this, when t- people are talking about how kind of corrupt this is, I, I always thought it was more of a, a straw man argument to justify to be like the underdog, but it is something that is a huge issue in our country and something that we really need to start. Like, if we usher in this new transparent age, m- you know, more young people get involved in politics, use communications, use social media like young people do, it's going to allow a lot of this stuff that goes on in the dark to come to the light. And I think, you know, for the betterment of our nation and for the continuance of our democracy, it's something that we that's essential that we do. So and you didn't say what it was like to be served. So to be served uh, is, you know, some guy shows up with a FedEx box and says, oh, I'm FedEx. And I'm like, you're not FedEx. You're rolling up in a pickup truck unmarked and you don't have a FedEx outfit on. He's, and then he keeps ringing your doorbell. I'm FedEx. I'm FedEx. I'm like, you're not FedEx. Like, what are you doing? And I'm ringing my head. I mean, you know, uh, you just had a streamer on. There's a, you know, my address you can find if you really hard, if you really try hard, you could find it. So I'm skeptical. Like, what's going on right now? You know, Long Island politics has some history with criminal activities. So I'm like, is something weird going on right now? And this guy just keeps ringing my doorbell. So I run out there and I'm just like, OK, we're going to confront this head on. Uh, the guy's like, are you Bill Cotter? Are you Bill Cotter? And I'm like, what, it, why, why do you need to know? And he goes, are you Bill Cotter? And I just see this black Sharpie written Bill Cotter on a FedEx box. And I'm like, that's not how FedEx delivers packages. They don't just write your name and nothing else on a package. So I'm skeptical. I'm like, am I about to be delivered a bomb right now? Like what, what's going on? So then I, I literally, uh, yeah. and, and me and the guy who was serving me laughed about this after. I just grabbed the box, opened it right in front of him, realized it's a bunch of papers because it was pretty heavy. It was a 400 <laughs> stack. It was a 400 uh, page stack of papers. I have a picture of it. And I'm just, I'm, when I grab the box, I'm like, oh, this is heavy. This, this could be something dangerous. So I rip it open. It's a bunch of papers. I'm like, oh, man, I'm so sorry. Uh, I'll take these. I just had no idea it was coming. I had no idea that this guy, and, and he was like, I was like, I, it felt heavy. I just wanted to make sure there was nothing dangerous in there because you're just handed me a, you're not a FedEx guy. You're handing me a FedEx box with, you know, very uh, dangerous looking, like, you know, it's, it's conspicuous looking. So I was just like, you know, then he laughed. I laughed. I took him in. I read that I was being like, you know, ex- my actual opponent, the one who's trying to sue everyone off the ballot. This time he wrote his name on the challenge. He actually, before it was just kind of like, oh, two random dudes are challenging, two concerned citizens who use the same notary, the same law firm, and have the exact same challenges are challenging you off the ballot. This time he put his name on it, so at least he has the, you know, the the cojones to Can put I, his own name wait, on it. So that I understand, so I understand your thought process. So, uh, by the way, we'll get into this in just a moment. You're a big defender of the Second Amendment. This is a big Second Amendment potential situation. Like you know, you know, you don't know what's going on here. You yeah. don't know who's at your door, right? So, but, but I don't. I'm assuming you weren't armed. But so your thought process was though could be a criminal. So what I'm going to do is rip it open real quick, and if it's a bomb, I go, you go. No, I'm I, taking us both down. I throw down. it. Was I it, throw it. Was, I throw it. Was at it a you. suicide opening? <laughs> no, it was just I throw it <laughs> as fast as I can, and then turn around. <laughs> And then you and then you and the processor laughed and had beers about it afterwards. That's incredible. Yeah. I mean, I mean, my my life has had some pretty weird happenstance stuff happen in it. Just like, you know, sometimes I feel like I'm living the plot of Forrest Gump. But uh, yeah. So who knows? You can expect anything at every turn. All right. So um, 
I asked you at the beginning, and mm-hmm. I think it's a legitimate question because I know who you are and I know what you guys do. And I asked you, it's not for content, it's real. Uh, and you said it's absolutely real. And I appreciate that you said the last guy that didn't take me seriously got knocked out, uh, Jose Canseco. But I am curious then, with it being real, Bill, like mm-hmm. we'll get into what you believe in a minute, mm-hmm. but I'm really curious about when you decided to do this and why. Like in the beginning, was it content or was there some moment you like, no, 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 from the beginning this was real and here's why? I mean, honestly, I've always uh, had a passion for public service. Uh, my grandfather was NYPD. Uh, I've had a couple, you know, way back down the line, uh, ancestors who were in Congress, who were naval a- admirals, and stuff like that. So service and, you know, I've had probably a, a relative that served in every single war in United States history. So um, public service has always been the forefront of my mind. Um, I kind of saw that uh, I had the possibility to both run for Congress and keep my job. That's a big um, hurdle for a lot of people who try to run for public office. I sort of, the first spark of it was when you, you know, when you turned uh, 18, you're like, oh, you know, I can, I can draw, well, you turn 16, you can get your permit, 18, you get your real license, um, and, you know, 21 is a big landmark. Is that and how then, it is in New York? Uh, yeah, that is what it is in New York, and then 21 is a hmm. big landmark, uh, and then, you know, after that, it's kind of like, oh, you don't unlock some new freedom after every age and then i was looking up okay 25 what what can you do you can you can rent a car without extra fees oh you can run for congress and i was like oh like that's the first spark of it like oh i'm i'm eligible for some pretty serious office so i was thinking about it and then um what really sparked it was uh sort of the situation around new york uh the new york metro area right now um the city and outside the city i grew up in has changed dramatically it's without a shadow of doubt and stuff I see in front of my face every day. Um, the situation has really deteriorated. It is not the city I grew up in. I'm now seeing this whole idea of, you know, New York City was bad in the 1980s. There was tons of crime and, you know, but we've gotten better since then. I sort of saw myself on the sidelines of uh, something and I didn't want to be part of the generation that let a backslide happen. And uh, I wanted to get involved. Hmm. I mean, covid Uh, really impacted young people, and we saw a lot of elected officials affect our lives in huge ways. Uh, People in high, like, you know, if you were in high school then, a lot of uh, key marks of the American childhood prom got canceled and whatnot. College kids got sent home. Um, So a lot of young people kind of woke up to the fact that, hey, wait a second, you know, we're sort of being robbed because of uh, elected officials not even taking our... um, uh, interests and opinions into mind. And, you know, then you start on that rabbit hole and you realize, oh, wait, they're stacking up debt and they're stacking up overspending that they're going to be long gone by the time that we're going to be left with the bill. And you start to look into this and realize, mm-hmm. oh, wait, we need young people to get involved in con- in Congress. We need young people to get involved in government because, you know, if we don't, we have cost of living being raised. Most people are working jobs with wages that haven't grown in the past 20 years. Meanwhile, the cost of living is going through the roof. I mean, I think the average uh, household uh, costs have gone up 40% in the past year or even more. That stat may be wrong, but it's the inflation numbers have gone through the roof. And we're looking at a situation where people have no hope of buying a house in the next five years, especially young people. Right, So. right. We're in a housing crisis. We're in a, you know, a wage, a lack of wage growth. Everyone's savings are being robbed by inflation. Oh, wait a second. I really need to get involved in this because we're going down a road where I turn 35 and, you know, our GDP might be less than the debt payments we're going to have to make on our national uh, debt. So we got a big problem coming. I like that you're young. Well, I like that you're young and you get a lot of these issues because, uh, to be honest, they're real and they affect people and they're boring. Like you want to talk about GDP? Like my, I just lost thousands of viewers. You know, I'm jo- mm. I'm joking, but I'm serious. Like people, like I've done this for a long time, Bill. I've done it in sports. I've done it. Mm. P- people just get bored with like things that really matter, and that's the truth. You know. Um, but one thing that you said to the New York Post, I believe, which I found fascinating, you said um, a tipping point was Randall's Island. 
full oh, of yeah. illegal immigrant shelters. And Randall's yeah. Island, for people that aren't in New York, is like a huge recreational facility with soccer fields. Mm-hmm. My boys grew up playing soccer at Randall's Island. Yeah. And it's just like it's the place where everybody in New York can go and play baseball, football, soccer, whatever. And now at least a percentage of a portion of it's a huge illegal immigrant shelter. And that's real quality of life stuff that, as you point out, you can see changing before your eyes in New York City. Yeah. And, and with that, even though it's a, a portion, only a portion is where the actual camp is, it's not like those people are contained to that spot. They're going everywhere. There's been games canceled. You see people on Twitter talk about how their son's soccer game got canceled because there was a guy who wouldn't get off the, the, the pitch, the field. And, uh, and it's all sorts of stuff just nice. sort of robbing, uh, you know, it, it, that was supposed to be a place you could drop your kid off to play a doubleheader baseball game, and if you had other things to do, so you could go and come back. But now, you know, you can't leave your kid for two seconds because there, there's people that we don't, we did not vet who got through the southern border, and we don't know their criminal history. We don't know if they're there to, with if they came to America not with the American dream in mind. And trust me, I know, like our nation's been founded by immigrants, well-meaning immigrants looking for the American dream. But we're in a situation where, you know, we need to figure out who all these individuals are, what their intentions are, and give them an easy path to citizenship in one way, but just ensure there is a system they have to go through to get citizenship, just a system in general, just some sort of uh, processing facility, some sort of containment of this total, unregulated, honestly, cartel-controlled border. So it's a huge I went to your site. Man, and I looked at all your, uh, yeah, I looked at all your issues on your site, and you know, well, first of all, you're running as a Republican, and so good luck in your future in sports media as someone who can speak directly to <laughs> that um, environment. Uh, but you'll be fine. You've always been an outsider and independent. Um, but your issues that you're into are, in one on one hand, I would say, like I like everything you're saying a lot, you know, and and they're they're kind of standard Republican on a lot of them. Meaning, you're worried about government spending, you're worried about inflation, you're worried about the Second Amendment. But then there's some things that you're also bringing to the table that maybe have a reflection of you being young. Like one of the things you're pointing out is you want to hold big pharma accountable, which is an interesting thing to say and a position to hold. And another one is what you brought up a minute ago, the housing crisis, which particularly affects your generation with high interest rates accompanying high housing prices. How do you ever, and by the way, low inventory and stock, how do you ever get in? And so I think those are, you got some really interesting stuff. I'm saying this sincerely, you got some really interesting stuff that you're advocating for um, that, I mean, I think I wouldn't hear from most people in sports media, but um, that you have chosen to run for as a Republican in New York. Yeah, I mean, a lot of those issues, especially the the big pharma piece, that has a lot to do with mental health, the opioid crisis, uh, and a host of other yeah. issues that my generation has been hugely impacted by. I mean, if you ask anyone from you know my age group, everyone knows someone who's been affected by the opioid crisis. Know someone who's uh, succumbed to uh, the you know the be- overdose. Uh, you know, someone's impacted. And that's something that big pharma is being held accountable, just like some people in Congress are being held accountable when they violate the Stock Act, like Tom Swasey. Um, but they haven't really been had to pay for the huge generational uh, systemic impact that the opioid crisis has had on this country. And it's gotten way worse since COVID. We were on a, a, a positive tra- mm-hmm. trajectory with overdose rates going down, um, uh, you know, Hill distribution was being lowered, uh, but we've rebounded in such a way that there might have been so many people who died due to the uh, basically the shutdowns during COVID and succumbed to uh, auxiliary things such as opioid overdose because of mental health issues because they were not able to go out. So you have a bunch of young Americans who lost their lives because of government uh, overstepping to prevent the loss of life, but hey, like, you know, we'll save this many people who won't die of COVID, but hey, all these hundreds of thousands of people are going to die of opioid overdoses. That needs to be, you know, we need to sort of point that out and be like, hey, can we hold these companies Mm -hmm. who made billions of dollars off of the deaths of so many Americans? Have they really been held accountable besides a couple million dollar fines here and there? Well, in your generation, opioids one thing. I mean, but your generation, and we can see the stats on this. 
there's a whole host of drugs they're taking under the advisement of big pharma. I mean, yeah, I don't know. I, I think, in I think it's like, like a huge percentage of your generation is on something. Yes. Antidepressant, ADHD, something, on something. And part of that is because— uh, and I think that's hugely concerning. It's hugely concerning because you have so many kids and so many like people my age where it's like they're not trying to find a solution. They just want to find users forever. And, you know, that might come to a total, you know, I'm, I might not be informed enough on this uh, topic, but, you know, the mental health crisis in our country is something that is having a huge impact on the next generation, a huge impact on, you know, our function as a society with many, uh, many topics, be it, you know, gun control, be it uh, a host of things. So why aren't we trying to find solutions instead of trying to find consumers? And big pharma has been geared towards profit right. and they have they've lost their original founding, you know, the original nuance of medicine, which is to help people. So, you know, that's probably a, a huge other well, issue that is going to be hard to tackle. But someone's got to be like, hey, f take the first steps. Well, again, I like all the issues mm -hmm. you're talking about. Um, so here's what I'd say. Like, I would wish two things for you. OK. If you win, um, I hope you stay strong because that place will co-opt you and turn you into something that you haven't been in your life, which is independent. That place, Washington, D.C., will turn you in to a creature like everyone else. But I do think you have a level of independence as exhibited by your career and the fact that you're even doing this as a Republican in sports media that shows maybe you can withstand that pressure. So if you win, I wish that for you. If you lose um, or you get kicked off the ballots or you get boxed out, I hope you keep talking. I, I mean, I hope you keep finding ways to serve, you know? The, I hope you just keep being you and being independent, uh, you know, and, be, and I hope being real. I appreciate that. And hopefully that's the best thing that comes out of this, that people start looking at the issues I'm raising and hopefully make a difference. All right. Bill Cotter, Billy Football of Barstool. Um, I, 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 you know, I guess I might have assumed that I'd run into you in some capacity, but I never thought it would be like this as you running for Congress in NY3. So I wish you luck, man. Thanks for coming in and doing this. This was fun. Appreciate it. Hey, you, wait, wait. Before you go, if you're going to be a good politician, you got to plug that website one more time, Billy. Congress.com. I got, I snuck one in there. Bill Say it Cotter again. Congress.com. Yeah, you snuck. That's right. Trust me. I can do a three-minute interview on Fox and Friends, and I'll hear about their website three times in three minutes. So Bill Cotter you got it three times in That's Cotter minutes. with a C. Welcome back with a C. Make it four. <laughs> <laughs> Make it four. All right. Thanks, Billy. Best of luck. All right. There we go. Um, fun show today. Good show today, I think. Uh, hit subscribe. YouTube. Spotify. Apple. And then, if you do that, I'll see you again next time.